Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so today we're going to cover the rest of the human systems that we're going to cover in biology. This isn't by all means all of them, but we're going to cover most of them. So let's talk about the three transport systems. In the body, they include the respiratory, cardiovascular, and digestive systems. The respiratory system has many functions. The lungs accomplish gas exchange via about 600 million alveoli. The respiratory system functions in more than just gas exchange. It assists in sense and sm of smell and in speech, helps blood to return to the heart, and helps to maintain the body's homeostatic condition. The system helps to return venous blood to the heart and helps to rid the body of excess heat and water. It also controls um, the breathing to adjust the body's acid base balance, so it functions in homeostasis. At the alveoli, pulmonary capillaries exchange gases and the circulatory system transports the oxygen to tissues and carbon dioxide away from the body. Air enters or leaves the respiratory system through nasal cavities where hair and cilia filter dust and particles, blood vessels warm the air, and mucus moistens the air. Air moves via this route. It goes in through the pharynx, through the larynx. The larynx is blocked by the epiglottis when you swallow. It passes the vocal cords, which is the space between, and the space between those is called the glottis. It passes down the trachea, through the bronchi, the bronchioles, and finally the alveoli. The vocal cords lie at the entrance to the larynx, and when air is exhaled through the glottis, the folds of the cords vibrate to produce sounds, which are under regulation by nerve commands to the elastic ligaments that regulate the glottal opening. Okay, so you will need to know this diagram, and we're going to move on into the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system's job is to move blood. Blood has several functions. It carries oxygens and nutrients to the cells, and it carries secretions and wastes away from them. It helps to stabilize internal pH. It contains phagocytic cells that fight infection, and it equalizes the body temperature in birds and mammals. Only birds and mammals because those are the endotherms. Humans have a blood volume of about four to five quarts with the fluid portion and cells that arise from stem cells found in the bone marrow. Plasma is 50 to 60% of the blood's volume. It's the fluid portion and it's mostly water. Some plasma proteins transport lipids and vitamins and others function in immune responses and in blood clotting. Plasma also contains ion, glucose, lipids, amino acids, vitamins, hormones, and dissolved gases. The red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes, um, they function to make up about 25 to 40% of the blood. Just depends. In mammals, red blood cells are biconcave discs that don't have nuclei and they transport oxygen. Red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which is an iron-containing protein that binds with oxygen in order to transport it. They form from stem cells in the red bone marrow, lose their nuclei, and they live about 120 days. After that, they go to be dissolved and uh, recycled in the spleen. White blood cells are called leukocytes. Leukocytes remove dead or worn out cells and protect us against invading microbes and foreign agents. There are several types of white blood cells. Neutrophils, basophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells are phagocytes, which means they'll go and swallow up stuff. Lymphocytes and the B and T cells are involved in the immune responses. There's also ones called the natural killer cells that directly kill body cells that have turned cancerous or have been infected by viruses. The final component of blood is the platelets, and they function in blood clotting, but they are not considered cells, just cell fragments. The 
typical route of blood circulation is heart to the arteries, then the arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then back to the heart. Blood circulates through two circuits. The human heart is considered a double pump, propelling blood into the two cardiovascular circuits. In the pulmonary circuit, oxygen-poor blood is pumped to the lungs from the right side of the heart, and oxygen-rich blood is returned from the lungs to the left side of the heart. In the systemic circuit, oxygen-rich blood is pumped from the left side of the heart to all of the body. Usually a given volume of blood in either circuit passes through only one capillary bed. An exception is blood from the digestive tract that also passes through the liver before entering general circulation. The heart has four chambers and four valves. And by the way, you will need to know this diagram. Each half of the heart consists of an atrium and a ventricle. The atrium is the receiving chamber and the ventricle is the pumping chamber. And they are separated by an atrioventricular valve. Those atrioventricular valves also have other names. They're called the tricuspid and bicuspid or mitral valves as well. The cardiac cycle consists of a sequence of contraction, which is called systole, and relaxation, which is called diastole. As the atria fill, the ventricles relax. Pressure of the blood in the atria forces the atrioventricular valves to open, and the ventricles continue to fill as the atria contract. The ventricles contract and the atrioventricular valves close and the blood flows out through the semilunar valves. The heart sound lub is made by the closing of the AV valves and the dup sound is the closure of the semilunar valves. So when you hear someone's heartbeat, you're actually just hearing those valves closing. The digestive system mechanically and chemically reduces food to particles and molecules small enough to be absorbed into the internal environment. The human digestive system is a tube with two openings and many specialized regions. Its overall extended length is between 6.5 and 9 meters, and it comprises the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, colon, rectum, and anus. The accessory glands in the digestive system include the salivary glands, the liver with its accompanying gallbladder, and the pancreas. Okay, now we're going to cover the response systems of the body. We just finished the three transport. The two response systems are called the endocrine and nervous systems. In the endocrine system, um, we're going to look at that one first. And in the early 1900s, Bayless and Starlings first demonstrated that a hormone later named secretin, released into the blood, triggers the secretion of pancreatic juices. The sources of hormones may collectively be called the endocrine system, which is intricately connected with the nervous system. No tissue or organ is beyond the reach of vertebrate hormones. The hypothalamus and pituitary gland are the primary controls for an entire range of hormones that are produced. And the endocrine system can be considered the longer lasting system. It's slower to respond than the nervous system, but its effects can last for a long, long time. The nervous system is composed of two parts, the central and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system of vertebrates includes the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system includes all of the nerves carrying signals to and from the brain and spinal cord. Peripheral sensory fibers are afferent, which means that they deliver signals into the brain and spinal cord. Motor fibers are efferent, which means that they carry signals away from the brain and spinal cord. The main component of the nervous system is the neuron. There are three primary classes of neurons in bilateral systems. Sensory neurons, which detect the stimulus at one or more receptor endings and relay information about it to other neurons. Motor neurons deliver excitatory or inhibitory commands from other neurons to muscles or glands. And interneurons are found only in the brain and spinal cord and they receive, process, and sometimes store sensory information and integrate most of the responses to it. Each neuron has three main parts, 
The cell body is the part that contains the nucleus and the metabolic machinery for protein synthesis. Dendrite are numerous, usually short extensions that receive stimuli, so they're the input zones for the nerve. The axon is usually a single, rather long extension, which is considered a conducting zone, that transmits impulses to other cells at its branched endings or output zones. Signals actually arise in the trigger zones of each neuron. There are three primary lines of defense for the human body. The first line of defense is always having an intact skin and the linings of the body tubes and cavities are also intact and they serve as effective physical barriers to invading pathogens, surface microbes, and chemicals that deter, uh, deter other pathogens. Second, innate immunity starts immediately after a pathogen has been detected or after internal damage. Phagocytic white blood cells complement and acute inflammation and fever can count, counter many threats. So basically the second love, secondary immunity is the one that is your body fighting it off. The third, which is called adaptive immunity, is set in motion where lymphocytes mask to defend the body against the pathogen. And some of these specialized lymphocytes remain circulating in the body as memory cells or secondary immunity will kick in should the antigen return. So basically it gives them a wanted poster and they know what they're looking for. Defenses of the human body can be enhanced or compromised. Immunization is one way and there's two types, active and passive. Active immunization involves deliberate production of memory cells by a vaccine that is made from killed or weakened bacteria or viruses. If a person has already been exposed to bacterial pathogens, passive immunity can be temporarily conferred by injective antibo injecting antibodies. An allergy is a secondary immune response or hypersensitivity to a normally harmless substance called an allergen. Examples of allergens can include drugs, foods, pollen, spores, and venom from insects. Exposures to allergens produ produce IgE antibodies, which cause the release of chemicals called histamines and prostaglandins. A local inflammatory response will result from those uh, chemical releases, and death can even occur due, due to anaphylactic shock, which is a condition in which the air passages leading to the lungs constrict. Fluid escapes too rapidly from the capillaries and the blood pressure drops. Autoimmune disorders involve lymphocytes that turn against the body's own cells. Rheumatoid arthritis is an example of that, and it's an inflammation of the joints caused by antibodies that treat the body's own IgG molecules as if they were antigens. Graves' disease, which is also called thyrotoxicosis, is an overproduction of thyroid hormones, which elevates metabolic rates, heart fibrillations, nervousness, and weight loss. Multiple sclerosis is another type of autoimmune disease, and it arises when autoreactive T cells trigger inflammation of myelin sheaths, which disrupt nerve transmission. Primary immune deficiencies are present at birth and result from altered genes or abnormal development. Severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, and adenine, adne, uh, sorry, adenosine Deaminase deficiency, ADA, are examples of uh, primary immune deficiencies. Secondary immune deficiencies are losses of immune function after exposure to some outside agent like a virus. When cell-mediated immunity is weakened, infections that would normally not be serious then become very deadly, and that would be the case of the secondary uh, immune, uh, sorry, the secondary immune deficiency, which would be HIV. Finally, we're going to move on to reproduction. We're going to look at the two male and female reproductive systems and talk a little bit about uh, the rest of the reproductive system. 
Human males have two testes, which are located in a, a pouch called the scrotum, which is a few degrees cooler than body temperature. It has to be a few, a few degrees cooler because sperm don't develop properly at normal body temperature of 98.6 or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Sperm production begins during puberty, and that's also the stage when secondary sexual characteristics start to emerge, like broadening of the chest, deepening of the voice, and development of excess body hair. Each testis contains many seminiferous tubules where sperm are continuously formed. Sperm move from a testis through the epididymis, which is a location for maturation and storage of sperm, and then during ejaculation, it passes through the vas deferens, ejaculatory ducts, and then the urethra, which is located inside the penis. The sperm-bearing fluid, called semen, is formed by secretions from the seminal vesicles, and it contains fructose and prostaglandins, and the prostate, which buffers against the acidic vaginal environment. So basically, it's pH buffer. The female reproductive system looks quite a bit different, even though embryologically they start off as the same organs and then they develop as you, as you develop as a baby. The egg is released from the ovaries. They go through the oviducts or fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes, the older term, we typically use oviduct now, and then goes into the uterus. If the egg has been fertilized and has formed a zygote, it's going to implant in the lining of the uterus called the endometrium. The lower part of the uterus is the cervix, which extends into the vagina, which in turn leads to the outer genitalia of the labia majora, minora, and clitoris. Most female mammals follow an estrus cycle, but humans and other primates have a menstrual cycle. In other words, there's no relationship between heat and fertility. During each cycle, an oocyte will mature and escape from the ovary, and if it's fertilized, may implant in the endometrium. If there's no implantation, the uterine lining is sloughed off at the end of each cycle of approximately 28 days, although that varies quite a bit between individuals. Okay, so those were extremely brief overviews of those major systems. I want you, I want you to, and I expect you to, review this material in your textbook, make sure that you do and add in notes of your own, and also make sure that you know the diagrams that I've stated that you need. Thanks and have a great day.